Well, I'm Lucy Hitchcock. I'm on the uh, board of UU's for Just Economic Community and lead a task force on, um, we call it the Green New Deal, but it's really climate, <laughs> everything to do with climate. And I wanna welcome you all. I'm really looking forward to hearing your stories. Every story of folks helping to save our planet gives me hope and encouragement to keep at it. We need some of those positive words now and then. Um, I'm in Oregon, which has several forest fires burning. So the climate crisis is now, not somewhere in the future. Um, I believe what we do locally and visibly is very important. It models what needs to happen everywhere. It can be contagious, even become popular. What is popular affects our government representatives. President Obama speaking of uh, public policy once said, make me do it. Each home that is electrified, each bus ride replacing a car ride, each tree planted in a tree barren neighborhood, each wind form or sol solar panel installed, each city's climate action plan passed makes a difference that can multiply when visible and bragged about. So tonight, let's do some bragging. Tomorrow, let's write our congregational reps. <laughs> and I hope tonight we will share ideas of what individuals and congregations can do on many levels. So um, let it all come out. <laughs> Terry, are you ready to introduce? The Ames group has, has focused on getting our local area to do all we can do to stop climate change, um, lobbying our, our community and city. Uh, one thing that occurred to me, if you want to build a, a an interfaith group, if you have congregation-based community organizing, like uh, Industrial Areas Foundation, Gamma Meal, um, let us see, DART, I'm forgetting one of them, but th these are groups that, that organize the community and they do it interfaith organization. And uh, that would give you context. If you've been doing it already, you should be in relationship with people from other congregations and other faith traditions. Okay. Our congregation, I know, started before 2008 um, we didn't have the organization, but we were working on climate change because we have one member who's done it for years and years and a scientist at Iowa State uh, University. Um, and having a lot of scientists in our congregation also made it easy to sell people. I don't think anybody went up and said, you can't do it. I did go up and, and tell Irv that I really thought that asking people to... Um, make their lives smaller and downgrade their life wasn't going to be a very good sales pitch. I didn't think people would buy it. Um, and I, I still have some reservations about that, but I think what needs to be done is, is to change what our, what our idea of a full life is. Um, and Allison who will speak, I, I don't know who goes first. Is it Leanne or Allison that will go first? I'll go first, Terry. Okay. Well, Allison's a friend, so <laughs> we live in the same neighborhood, and we celebrated Easter together this year. Okay. Um, I'd like to hear how you did it, what you did. Yeah, thank you, Terry, so much for putting this together and inviting me, everyone who helped make it happen. Um, super interesting to hear the stories from Saltwater, and I think there are some similarities for sure and definitely some differences. And like Terry was saying, we live in a small university town, Iowa State University Technical you know, School with lots and lots of scientists and, and especially at our UU congregation, we have kind of a high concentration and a small group that has been meeting for years and years. So that's Gadberg Science Circle and they've been, you know, meeting and talking about lots of different science 
topics, but I always would come around to climate change because they've all been concerned about it, paying attention for a long time. And, um, and Irv is, uh, you know, he was going to be here tonight, but he had some other obligations and he was really well known in the community in other areas that he was supporting social justice or he was working with a you know local educational foundation and he was kind of well connected and well known in the community and as we um, started becoming more active with our our climate work that was helpful and it was really nice to be coming from a, a you know kind of a, a foundation of from having scientists in our group that were just there with us and and it felt good as we did different things we started out um well and i don't know when it all started terry because it was it just seems like it's always been there in ames and i moved to ames in 2017 and met irv and he said well i think we need to start a, a small group and we'll call it climate solution circle and I said, okay, sure, I'll help it. And I helped with a play called um, Youth versus Gov with our RE kids. And I think somebody from the uh, Eugene UU wrote the play, actually. And it's a fun one. It's on the UU Ministry for Earth website. And so anybody can, can do this play. It's pretty easy to run as a reader's theater if they want to memorize their lines. Great. But um, and we've had different speakers as well, but something that Irv was really adamant about was that we needed to, as a congregation, make a statement and make a commitment that we support, that we declare a climate emergency. And I, I forget what all of the, the wording was that went with it. I think he used it from another source. And, and eventually then we had a vote at our annual meeting and, um, signed it was i think a just unanimous vote to submit an action for immediate witness about climate change and so that was then sent on to to gen um to the general what is it just general general, UU? general assembly thank you yeah and at the time um some people were like oh we're just doing a declaration what's the big deal but later it became really useful for us to say to um, our office manager, hey, the congregation voted unanimously to support climate action. Can we all meet here for free and invite other people from the community? Could you help us design a flyer for an event that we want to run? Can we print some papers? Can you help us with a listserv? Can we use your Zoom Pro account when, when the pandemic hit? And, and all these little things that you know, weren't huge, but nobody ever blinked an eye and said, oh, that's, you're asking too much. They all felt like they had been um, empowered by the congregation. Like, yes, this is what we want to do as a congregation. We support this work. And so that ended up being a, a really, uh, you know, I think a useful, useful thing. And I'm not used, I, I don't mind asking for things, but I don't want it to be too hard. And, and they just, you know, made it so easy and, and welcoming. So, and then um, after that, we had an event, I think it was September 8th. And we always, we had a lot of different events where maybe they were um, climate strikes or rallies in solidarity with things that were happening nationally or globally. And that always felt kind of nice to be part of something bigger. And um, I think it was Rise for Climate. And um, we, you know, Irv just grabbed the phone book and looked for the phone numbers of other congregations, other churches, other faith groups in the community and started calling and sending letters. And he had a couple other folks help. I'm not sure. I see Sue Jarnigan is on the call. I think she was a part of helping. And, and we also kind of looked at, um, strategic people in the community that were already um, concerned about climate change and we asked them to recruit people from their congregations. And so, and we called it interfaith and community-based. Of course, you know, as you use, we want to include folks that are also not uh, super religious. And so that was important to a lot of us as well. Um, when we, 
you know, that we asked um, someone from Iowa Interpower Faith and Light to speak, uh, somebody who is kind of a, a, he's a great speaker and a little bit well known. He came and, or he said, yes, I'll, I'd love to do that. And we had a, another um, climate activist that's a lawyer, Channing Dutton from, we have Des Moines, Iowa, and he was part of helping with the, um, the lawsuit for the youth that were um, involved with the lawsuit for the each state, I, I forget how it was worded, but each state had one or two youth that were suing the government for ignoring the impacts of climate change. And so maybe not each state, but a bunch of states from around the country. And so he was the, the lawyer that was representing the Iowa youth and he came and spoke and, and that was very nice to have him. Yeah, from our Children's Trust, thank you. and. Um, and our minister also gave, uh, you know, shared some words. I forget what he he did in that program um, specifically, but that was also important for for our congregation to see our minister actively sort of endorsing and supporting that work. Uh, we sort of expected twenty five or thirty people, and then we had a hundred, and everybody was like, "Oh my gosh, we need more cookies!" <laughs> so. <laughs> It was very exciting and just seemed like right time, right place. And we did, thankfully, you know, other thing that we didn't realize was so important, but we thankfully had a sign in sheet for people to, you know, give their contact information if we wanted to reach out to them again. And that was kind of the, the base for um, our group that formed later on. And you know, we were only going to have our event go for one hour. There was a sharing time and our event went to two hours and we said, okay, we really, we got to cut it off now. <laughs> but it was a, it was a great conversation, great presentations. And, and um, so we kind of started with, you know, contacting people to see if they would like to meet again. And we really did um, try to intentionally cultivate contacts from other faith groups. So that was, uh, I think, powerful thing for our group. And it was funny because I asked Irv, I said, well, what should we call ourselves? What's, what's easy? And he said, oh, just how about CAT? Because climate action team, that's quick and easy. And at the time, I didn't know it, but later maybe some of you guys know that the UU Ministry for Earth Justice they have like a, a collaboration of climate action teams that also identify as cats. And so that was just the tremor in the force. We picked a common name, I don't know. So um, we worked a lot on our vision and mission and our goals. We divided up um, our volunteers and our members to, you know, tried to have them align projects with the different goals that we had. And, you know, definitely I, I uh, understand what you're saying, Mary, about how you can go so many different directions with climate change, but it's good to try to focus and, and um, keep with a few things. And, and at that time, or I ended up being invited to go to a workshop by a, um, an architectural design firm called REG, and they were helping with the aims. Um, oh, Leanne, help me out. What was it? It was the community impact plan or what was it? The, mm, let me look at my notes here. Let's see. Sorry. It was the, a major plan for the city of Ames that it lasts for like three years. I forget the name specifically. And REG was helping with that for Ames. And they invited me to this workshop that they were holding, and it was all about climate action planning. They had a number of Iowa State University professors presenting on the climate science, and um, all of that was just so exciting to see professionals taking climate action resiliency, climate action adaptation, climate action planning seriously as a profession. And, and I knew that they were working with the city of Ames. So I, I was visiting with them all and I was very intrigued by everything. And I happened to meet another uh, woman who 
was from an interfaith climate action group in Des Moines, Iowa. And she said, oh, we're working with this um, fantastic organization out of University of Northern Iowa, Center for Education, Environment and Energy. They have grants to help communities in Iowa complete greenhouse gas inventories. Boy, this climate action stuff can be, feel so slow, but you gotta get that inventory done because that's when you're, you know, you set your baseline and just get that done and start chipping away at things and, and figuring out how to measure a community's greenhouse um, overall emissions and looking at different sectors. And it, it does get technical pretty quick. I think Leanne's gonna talk a little bit more about that. So I'll just stop with that, but it was, exciting too later i went and and talked with all of our city council members one-on-one -on -one and a few of our other um you know different volunteers came with me but i i was able to say to them like look we we need to address climate uh change we need to do proactive things we need to start planning on adaptation and look at all these other peer cities that are doing these things. Sometimes they make a declaration. Sometimes they just make a resolution or they just put it in their budget. They need to get the greenhouse gas inventory done. Lots of different ways to do it. But our city council member, I suspect lots of them are like this, really like to look at other peer cities. As much as we say we want to be innovators, we also really like to, to um, not be too far out on a limb on our own either. So that that was exciting for them too, I think, to see they could be a part of something and you know, not feel so overwhelmed by the whole climate change problem and just say, okay, this is what cities are doing. They're addressing it with a plan. And that was just their, their language that they're familiar with. And um, so, so that was exciting to see progress. And um, you know, it also just by the, function of how city budget seasons work. It, it really, we had measured progress. It takes time. They only have money to, we, they have to put out their requests for proposals to do projects. And, you know, they have to um, do that in a very systematic way, then decide who they want to hire and, and, and then get started. And before any of that happens, they have to vote to put it in the budget too. So it's just a, a thing that takes time. And, um, you know, that has been a very good learning experience for all of us, learning about how city government works, seeing our city council members at grocery stores or even, you know, out and about in our community, they, they are part of our community. And um, I think that it's been very empowering for a lot of people to see how, how that has worked. Um, it is interesting also, um, you know, to think about how we were functioning as an organization, as the Clim Ames Climate Action Team, and, you know, definitely the idea of wanting to have fun and, and not get too depressed about things, that's always top of mind as well, and, um, you know, what is our capacity, and and I really also appreciated, Mary, your comments about not wanting to be super purist about things and just meeting people where they're at and, and um, trying to find common ground and, and see what, think about how climate impacts everything and find out what people care about and trying to make those connections to help more people um, take action for climate change. So I think that um, some of those very most important um, aspects of climate advocacy, I think we certainly have in common, even though we ended up going more with the, the city uh, approach. But it's also exciting to see other cities that are also doing it. It's not like it's just Ames. And, and then um, the mayor, another part of this very systematic approach, wanted to create a supplemental input committee um, to help with creating a climate action plan for the city of Ames. And, um, and so to volunteer to be on this committee, you had to apply and then, and he wanted to have, make sure that there was a diverse 
um, group of, of members on that committee. And so he, you know, kind of has different sectors, a residential sector, a faith-based sector, and business sector. There was maybe 10, 12 different sectors that he wanted to make sure were, were represented. And I applied and, and was chosen to represent the faith-based sector on the supplemental input committee. And it just also really helped me realize coming from a UU church gets people's attention, saying that you're part of an organization that's established, has a history, is part of the community. It's not just me, and it's a, a bigger community that, that is behind me as well. And so it's interesting. And I, and I really, I, we knew that when we started with our approach to the interfaith um, event that we hosted, but it, it's just kind of been something that I realized, wow, that, that means a lot to our elected officials, or it means something to other people in the community to say that, that I'm representing an organization, a faith-based organization in this case. So that is something that other UUs can can use as well. I'm going to pass over to Leanne, who has been so wonderful to work with. She uh, contacted me right before COVID started and said, hey, I'm a scientist from, uh, and I'm really concerned about climate change. I want to start getting involved. And I said, oh, absolutely. This is, this is the perfect place for you. Come on in. So, been so it's been wonderful to get to know her and work with her. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, um, so I'll tell you briefly about me. I, I, did, I taught astronomy in the physics and astronomy department at Iowa State for 41 years, retired in 2014, spent the next six years coping with life emergencies, two mothers that got into their final years, and then we moved into a different house because I couldn't walk upstairs anymore, and then I got a new hip, and the next thing I know, it was early 2020, and I'm ready to go. And I found this group and I uh, managed to go to one live meeting before we went Zoom. <laughs> so I've got lots of new friends that I've only seen on Zoom. Um, and uh, I got involved, the, the, um, our climate action team had three subgroups that were operating at the time. They had a, a, one that focused on local action, one on education and one on state and national uh, connections. And I, I signed up to join the local group and what, what I really wanted to know, I, I know the science, I know what needs to be done. I can do the, the math to look at solutions as well as problems associated with climate. Um, it, but I, what I didn't know is what, what do you push to make change, right? I didn't know the people side of it at all to speak of. And this group was where I found what I, the complementary strengths that I needed to, to actually do something that might make a difference. So I joined the local one. And, and the first, first thing I realized is that, and, and we kind of all realized this, that just telling people we have the answers, listen to us, was not gonna go anywhere. We had, we had absolutely no authority to go out into the streets and tell people, hey, you've got to change the way you're doing things. Hey, we have to make some changes in the rules. You know, what? What we needed to do was to listen to people first, the people, especially the people making decisions and find out how are they making the decisions? What's constraining their decisions? What decisions might they make differently and better from our perspective? If the rules change, what rules need to change? Who makes those rules? How can we change them? And so what the what CAT1, the first the subcommittee CAT1 did was to start inviting people for interviews. And we invited the city council one by one. And we invited city staff, a whole bunch of people from the city staff. We invite, invented, invited Story County supervisors and Story County staff. We invited somebody from the Department of Transportation, which happens to be in town. We invited some people from the business community. And we had a very standard group of questions that were very non-threatening starting off with what can you you know what's something that you have been involved with or that you know about that we should hear about that has to do with you know climate action and they all had some something to say and it made them feel good because they brought something to us and um so we did this we did this every other week for we've now done this every other week roughly for two years so we've talked to a lot of people we've talked to some people several times we've talked to city council three times now different questions each time as the process has gone along. And um, 
so I, you know, I kind of felt like this was going to be effective in helping us learn things and maybe in, in some connections, but what I hadn't really underestimated the extent to which this built their trust in us. Because after they had a chance to talk with our small group for an hour and we let them lead the conversation to a fair extent. We said, here's, you know, you've got their questions. Can you just start with those and start talking? Um, and and then we then we had a conversation. They could see that we weren't wild, unreasonable people, that we were really trying to understand things, but that we also had quite a constellation of knowledge base in within the group um, from all of our background. Um, so then they started to listen to us too. So we write, we now we write letters and to the council and we write, you know, communications and they, they pay attention because they know we're serious. We do our homework um, and we pay attention. So that that's number one is, is we call it an interview and that's very important because it implies that we're listening and that that's how it has to be. Um, so in, in meanwhile, one of the reasons I think we're focusing so much on local action is because right now that's where the action is. I also feel very strongly if cities can't do this, we're, we're completely out of luck because so many of the decisions that affect climate are made at the city level that if cities can't do this, we're, we've had it. Um, so it's really important, but it's also where things were moving. So as I got into things, we already had this mo movement to get the greenhouse gas inventory. They had retained the pale blue dot in order to get this done and they, they got their report. And then they went out and retained another group, the Sustainability Solutions Group, to get the Climate Action Plan going. Um, and as this was happening, another subgroup formed in our Climate Action Team, which we call CAT4, because we already had three of them. So CAT4, it's, it's a little more diffuse. It's kind of your strategic fast action. Every week, it looks at what's been happening. Should we fire off a letter to council? Should we fire off a letter to the editor? Should we go to the next council meeting and say something? Um, what should we do? And so it's the one that, that tries to sort of stay on top of things, which sometimes seem to move quickly. And one of the things that, that Cat4 did was to discover that Ann Arbor had a really exemplary climate action plan. And it's a similar town to Ames, except bigger. And so it, there's a lot to be said for looking at their example. And they have a dynamite person in charge of their plan. She's the director of their Office of Sustainability and Innovation. And that innovation is key because so much of what we're talking about is finding new ways to do things. Business as usual is gonna get us the same old results we've had all along. And so we invited her into town and invited everybody we could think of to come and to listen, well, by Zoom, everyone we can think of to listen to her. We recorded it um, and we then had a session where we talked with members of council about what Ann Arbor was doing and whether, what relevance that might have for Amos. For me, it's Ann Arbor is an existence proof as mathematicians like to say. It says if one city can do it, then in principle, so can others. So just having one that seems to be making very rapid progress is so helpful. Um, so what else can I say here? Um, it's been interesting that, that of the four subgroups for CAT, one in four have been very active and meeting intensely and very busy and, and doing a lot of things. The, the education one and the state and national one have been fairly inactive. And I don't know what it is. It may just be that the moment is right for Ames, and that's why that local one is going so well. Or it may be that you there's a you know a different scale of urgency or opportunity for the other goals. But it may also be that you have to meet often enough to keep up the momentum. And I think our group is a, the whole group, the ACAT community group, only meets once a month, and that feels very <coughs> passive compared to the the groups that are meeting every couple of weeks or every week. And so that's something else I observed. The demographics of our group, um, I don't know what fraction are now affiliated with UU. I would guess maybe half at this point have an affiliation and the other half don't. Um, there's certainly quite a few retired individuals in our group, but there's also some very young people. We have college students, we have recent graduates, we have early career people. 
um, also involved in our groups, including in the, the very active CAT1 and CAT4. So we have managed to bring in not just the people who are <laughs> at our stage of life, but, but a, a broader spectrum, which is very encouraging as well and very helpful. Thank you. It's great. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody again. Lucy did, and this is wonderful. What a great evening. I really enjoyed it. It, it gives me hope. Thank you. <laughs>